Is Jesus actually the words on the pages of scripture? Can we dial in and tune in to the voice of God so that we can hear that radio frequency and get downloads and get visions and get dreams and get interpretations and revelations from God? Did Jesus have the DNA of God when he spoke? And did the words carry God's DNA when he spoke them? And how about we play a game today? Come on down. You're the next contestant on Name That Heresy. All that and more today on this episode of Churchpreneurs. Let's get this. Podcast. My name is Richard Moore. In this podcast, I talk about everything that's moving me in relation to church and theology, hopefully to empower you in your ministry, church, Bible study, theological understanding, and most importantly, your personal growth in Christ. Before we get started, if you would do me a favor and please hit the like button, subscribe, and hit the bell to get notifications from my channel. Even if you want to, leave a comment. It helps YouTube's algorithms get this out to more people. Today, I wanted to cover something that someone sent me. Someone uh, sent me this video, uh, this sermon from Bill Johnson of Bethel Church in Redding, California. Asked me to cover it uh, because it said some really interesting stuff. I'll probably do this in two parts because it's quite a long sermon, 45 minutes, and I want to actually deal with it and watch the whole thing and do a reaction video to his sermon. The sermon is titled, uh, Reasons Why You Might Struggle to Hear God's Voice. And it was given in 2017, but just recently posted on his YouTube. The reason I do these videos, do this video, especially on reviewing stuff that people have said who are in the New Apostolic Reformation, is to warn you in a loving and caring manner as I possibly can to mark and avoid these people. I've watched this sermon throughout, uh, dealt with the material, taken detailed notes, and I'm of the opinion that Bill Johnson should be marked and avoided because in Romans 16, 17, the Apostle Paul tells us to mark and avoid those who oppose sound doctrine. And this sermon alone, I'll show you and, and, and give you detailed reasons why this sermon alone by itself could be reason enough to mark and avoid Bill Johnson because he opposes sound doctrine. And I'll hopefully show you, make a case for you today that his teaching opposes sound doctrine. Fair use laws are laws in place so that people can critique public teaching, public uh, dialogue, uh, public materials for public critique. Not taking, I'm not trying to take his words and say that they're my own. I'm trying to critique them, and that is falls under fair use laws. Uh, let's dive right in. Um, okay. Bethel TV. So this is. And also. Um, 2017, right Friday after the Open Heaven Conference. That Eric did with Mike Bickle, John Bevere, and myself. It was awesome. It was, it was amazing. Mike Bickle. Okay, uh, got to stop right there. Interesting. Um, Mike, this is 2017, the Open Heaven Conference, and I'm going to uh, whirl up a, another thing here to show you that he was actually, Mike Bickle was actually at the Open Heaven Conference. Got my desktop uh, squared away so y'all can see all this. So this is uh, on Bethel TV uh, on their, their replays. You can watch after the fact. And here you go. I think he must be talking about this one right here. If you can see that, if I'm scrolling over it, it kind of gets larger. Eric Johnson interviews uh uh, Bevere and Bickle, and I guess Bill Johnson was on that panel. Then here, Mike Bickle speaking once, twice. Uh, I don't know if this is a separate one or what What that is. A th third, fourth, fifth. Uh, looks like he spoke four times at the whole conference and was on two panels probably. Not real sure. I don't have access full access to them anymore. I, I, I uh, don't don't have a, a Bethel TV uh, prescription. But uh, yeah, so Mike Bickle. I, at first I thought uh, I had just done a video on Mike Bickle. 
And at first I thought, oh, wow, he was there like in October, but he wasn't. This was uh, this was posted just recently, but Bill delivered this sermon, this talk uh, in 2017. So uh, it was originally shared October 8th, 2017, but this video, I'll leave the link in the description of the video. Um, and he opened saying here that Mike Bickle's in the audience in 2017, uh, he took part in the Open Heavens, so I want to say this uh, just real quick as the Open Heavens uh, conference uh, just finished as well, uh, Bethel, um, in October, I think they have it every year, and then uh, in 2017, Mike Bickle was there, and uh, the Open Heaven conference, uh, there's some chatter online that uh, the cessationism conference put on by G3 Ministries that's upcoming uh, cost $299, I believe. And, you know, they charge so much money and all, and, and a lot of people online have been talking, how could they charge people for saying that the Holy Spirit does not do anything today? That's not what the position of cessation teaches, but uh, they, yeah. So there's a straw man there, first of all. Um, then secondly, they say they're charging money for, you know, <laughs> this conference, $299. And uh, it's a four-day conference, I believe. I don't want to exactly speak on the cessation of the conference because I don't know the, all the details. But charging for a conference is a normal thing. And I wanted to point out the Open Heaven Conference charges the same price. So I did the breakdown. They charge uh, two ninety-nine around there, two forty-nine. It might be. I'm not exactly sure, but almost every year it's about the same. It's a four-day conference, usually something like that. Mike Bickle spoke four times. They had all together, I think, Bevere, uh, several speakers. Right now, the, the 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 post view, if you want to view all the sessions online, you can get it for 160 uh, to look at all the sessions online. So they have no overhead. All the people said, well, they don't have overhead. The cessationism conference doesn't have any overhead. They're doing it in their own building, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I did the numbers as well. So if we're talking about money, and it's just about the money, and all the critics of, let's say, the cessationism perspective would say that uh, this is ridiculous for them to be having a conference that costs money, um, then let's have a look at Bethel. They charge $160 for their post view. You can watch the conference thing online, $160. You could attend it for $299 or somewhere in, this, in the same ballpark. Um, and then you could also become an iBethel TV member for $9.99 a month. With they have 120,000 global subscribers to their online service, which comes to roughly $1.2 million monthly income. And do that times 12, $14.4 million yearly for Bethel TV as income. That's just for their subscriptions, not to mention what they would charge if you actually bought the Hope in Heavens conference. Um, I didn't even count all those uh, purchases of whatever conference you want to buy online. That's $14 million just from their 120,000 subscribers. Um, so, yeah, there's that. Uh, Something about that sticks in my craw. <laughs> a lot of those guys argued that you, charging money. Um, the argument on money charging uh, kind of backfires. Anyways, I digress. No, it's not a digression. It's the point. Anyways. You might say, Richard, oh, you're just a cessationist. No, I'm not actually, but uh, no one asked me my opinion on these things. So um, I've just tried to, like, let's play fair. You know, if we're playing fair, like money, the NAR is not uh, above money grubbing and going after money. So they, I, but that's just normal. Like normal people charge for conferences. It takes them money to pay speakers to get the best speakers to get the people there and ha and put on a conference it takes money so i'm not saying that it's not wrong that you know it's wrong to have money i'm just saying like you know those people who have argued are bethel friendly that you should not be providing uh you know it should not be asking for money from a conference um are very bethel friendly and bethel ask the same amount for their conferences so anyways so then also the hope and open heaven teaching, I want to just kind of dive into the open heaven teaching really quickly, it refers to the idea, if you might not be familiar, uh, open heavens, like what? What? Um, 
the open heaven idea is that the heavens are opened above us and pouring out the realities that exist in heaven onto earth. Uh, Bethel has this conference every year. Bill Johnson has an eight-week online course called Open Heavens. Um, Hillsong, I believe, even has a song called Open Heaven, which promises signs, wonders, dreams, visions, and revelations because Christians live, according to this teaching, under an open heaven and are an open heaven. Bill Johnson says it quite often. You are an open heaven, meaning the realities that exist in heaven, you can release them into this world. You can make those things happen in this world. You can make the realities of heaven reality for us here and now. So um, that's the Open Heaven Conference, and I just wanted to highlight that. Um, so Mike Bickle was there, and I, like I said, I just did a, a video on Mike Bickle, and um, he is connected to the NAR. Mike Bickle has, for years and years and years, said he's not NAR, but this is clear. This is clear evidence. He shared the stage. He spoke at their conference. If you speak at their conference, you believe what that church is teaching. I would never go and speak at a church's conference unless I really could buy into everything that that church stands for and teaches. So Mike Bickle is part of the NAR. It's as clear as day. He holds to the apostolic and prophetic paradigms that Bill Johnson, Bethel, and Chris Vallotton hold to. Chris Vallotton says uh, January of 2020, and he clearly espoused all the main tenets of the New Apostolic Reformation and called it their movement. And she said, this is the DNA of their movement. I've done a big, lengthy uh, four-series, four-show episode uh, on that and what, what my time was like there. And that we should make covenants with apostles and prophets. He had made a covenant with Bill to be his, uh, his prophet and, Bill and, and, and for him to be his apostle. So... Um, it's pretty clear Mike Bickle belongs to the NAR. Here he is at the, I don't know what he said there. I don't even know what he said there. Um, open heavens is the idea that uh, kingdom now theology, that the kingdom is now and the realities that are in heaven, you can have access to them today, here and now, right now. So that's pretty clear um, Mike Bickle belongs uh, to the Bethel stream, which is the New Apostolic Reformation. All right, back to the sermon. Here we go. There's a riot. That's all I have to say. Mike, Mike, are you Mike Bickle's somewhere? a riot. He's funny. He's around there. Uh, he's way in the back. You know, real quick, I, I would say Mike Bickle's funny. Yeah, I think he's pretty funny. So, yeah. Bless you. I love you. We are so privileged to have Mike here. My goodness. Mike Bickle's in the room. He says, bless you. His wife is with him as well, apparently. So this is 2017. His wife, Diane, was here. She, she uh, had to go back yesterday. But actually, she went to where my wife is in Washington, D.C. for the call there. Uh, and that's going to be... Oh, that's interesting. I just missed that. Uh, the call was in Washington, D.C. in 2017. That's Lou Engel. So this is actually really interesting. Um, this is them showing how they move and they operate and they send their teachers to... I mean, so Mike Bickle's IHOP, International House of Prayer, and he was sent to Bethel to preach at Bethel or went to Bethel, sent, I don't know, but went to Bethel. Uh, Bill Johnson's wife was with, uh, with his wife at the Send in Washington, D.C., so it's very interesting. That's a really interesting. Tomorrow, so that'll be a good thing. It's probably on God TV, I'm assuming. Uh, they usually post that stuff, so anyway. <laughs> it's on God TV, yes, Probably the send and all these other things are on God TV. So um, tonight's going to be outrageous. I am so excited. We are so privileged to have Mike Bickle here. It's the first time we've wanted him for years. And so we are so privileged to have Mike Bickle here. I wonder if Bill Johnson would say that now um, in this current stat state of um, Mike Bickle uh, standing um, under these allegations and being uh, investigated now for uh, sexual improprieties and sexual misconduct um, seemingly for qu quite some time, for some years, back to the before the start of IHOP. So I wonder if Bill Johnson would stand by him now as being so privileged to have him speak there. Uh, it, it finally, uh, it just finally worked out. So I'm a happy camper, 
And in honor of Mike, his favorite story of all, I just found out on the right over here, is this one. If you've already heard it, pretend like you haven't. All right, so I'm just going to skip on these. I think if you've watched Bill Johnson before, you know, just to save some time, he tells jokes before he starts, two or three sometimes, depending on, uh, you know, whatever. But uh, anyways, he, he kind of goes on his joke things. These are quite funny, actually. I, I, I would recommend them if you want to look at the link down. And uh, they're funny jokes. So he does that beforehand. Um, but And then he goes into um, product placement. So it's interesting. I, I asked myself, which pre Christian preacher can I name that tells jokes? I tell jokes. I do. I actually, I try to be funny. I try to be appealing. I try to uh, speak illustrations, use illustrations that are uh, engaging. Preachers ought to probably do that. Um, but then I thought, what preacher uses jokes and product placement right before their sermon? So uh, let's go on to the product placement, see if I can uh, kind of skip ahead all right, so uh, he gets skips, I skip past his jokes. Uh, they're funny. Go look at them. But here he comes to product placement. So uh, like a good preacher, I don't think I've ever, uh, yeah, tried to sell stuff from my bookstore. <laughs> I don't have a bookstore to sell from. But, uh, you know, sell stuff, sell your merch from your bookstore. But here he goes. We've got, uh, <laughs> we, we've got a bunch of new stuff that I think is, is gone. Um, actually, some of it. Um, Seth Dahl helped me uh, with a God is Good book and put it into a children's picture book. So, pretty excited about that. It just came out this week. I didn't even know it was coming out this week. I got to my chair at the conference and it was sitting there. So, anyway, this is available uh, somewhere. So, a in book the called God is Good for and, Children. Uh, we have another little book on Is God Really Good? This one's a little embarrassing. The um, publisher made just a, a slight little mistake on the opening page, one of the introductions publishes note that this is God good. I was taken from a, an interview that I did with him. Well, they forgot one of the O's on the word good. So it says, is God God? <laughs> and there's already rumors circulating out there that somebody started that I don't believe Jesus is God. And so I'm glad to be able to contribute to that controversy. <laughs> we don't want that thing dying down because then it won't be any fun anymore. So I got to laugh with them. Okay. So, uh, I, <laughs> that's, fu that's funny. Okay. It's cute. So the mistake was made in one of his books that they took it, the, the one letter O out, is God, God. And it turned it into not, is God good, is God, God. And he says, there's a controversy out there that I didn't start, but that um, I don't believe that Jesus is God. Um, <laughs> it's pretty interesting um we we didn't start it bill um uh you started it by all your books and all your teaching and all your writings and you diminished the divinity of jesus christ like you will in this sermon um and yeah so kind of kind of funny all right so just a side mo thing moving on here we go published roses i am so sorry uh, it'll, it'll work out fine but anyway that's if you want one of the error copies they're in there the rest of it's good i believe but uh, and then finally we have the first batch actually there's none left but just let me show you what you can't have <coughs> the, oh, the the bethel edition of the passion translation new testament psalms proverbs song of songs is uh this is the not leather and the leather will be here in december and this one, but I'll tell you what, this is the best knot leather I've ever seen. But anyway, it's available in there. It will be next week. We don't have any more now. Is, is there anyone? Oh, I want, I want to go back to have that, that screen up. So, um, yes, Bethel has a Bethel version of the Passion Translation. And uh, so I think that's very important. He, they publicize it. They push it. This is very interesting that it fell. And someone sent me this video and uh, that... It's there right in the sermon time or the, the, the YouTube video. And so, yes, notice there is a 16-page forward from Bill Johnson over here. Um, this is what, the, I guess, was on their screen uh, in, in their auditorium. Psalms, Proverbs, Psalms, Psalm, Solomon, New Testament. So I guess this is not the version. He doesn't have the Old Testament done, I don't think. Uh, Brian Simmons, who 
created the Passion Translation. Available in the uh, Bethel Bookstore this Sunday, pre-order online. And uh, here you go. I'm going to whirl up my desktop and or get, get this one up. Here you go. Here's the Bethel version edition of the Passion Translation. So exclusively on the Bethel store. This is their version um, that's exclusively for their Bethel store, I guess. I don't think you can get it anywhere else. Special forward, he said, 16-page forward by Bill Johnson. I'm very curious, but I don't want to buy it because I would be giving them my money uh, because this is a terrible, terrible translation. Literally, it changes the text of Scripture. So you go down, you can scroll down and see how nice it is. It really looks beautiful um, with leather bound and all sorts of different options. So I want to read to you, with this up, a review was written by Andrew G. Sheed, a member of the New International Versions Committee on the Bible Translation, uh, on that translation. He is the head of the Old Testament uh, department and Hebrew department at Moore Theological University or College, Moore Theological College in Sydney, Australia. Don't know much about the college. He wrote an article in Familios, the academic journal of the Gospel Coalition, in which he made this conclusion about the Passion Translation. Well, he he did a review of, I believe it was Song of Solomon. He reviewed Song of Solomon, so he's a Hebrew expert. Um, he is head of the Hebrew department at Moore Theological College in Sydney. And here's what he said f- about the Passion Translation. And I'll link this article in, in my show notes as well. The Passion Translation is not just a new translation. It is a new text. And its authority derives solely from its creator. Like Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon... Brian Simmons has created a new scripture with the potential to rule as canon over a new sect. He further concludes, The Passion Translation is not a Bible, and any church that treats it as such and receives it as canon will by that very action turn itself in to an unorthodox sect. If the translation had been packaged as a commentary on scripture, I would not have needed to write this review. But to package it as scripture is an offense against God. Every believer who is taught to treat it as the inscripturated words of God is in spiritual danger. Wow. So here they are. They're treating it as the Bible. They're treating it as the inscripturated words of God, selling it as Bible. Bill Johnson is promoting it here as the Bible. He's written a 16-page foreword for their special edition of the Passion translation Bible. So according to Andrew G. Sheed, a Hebrew expert and the chair of the Department of Hebrew at Moore Theological College, says that anybody who treats this word, this Bible, this passion translation as the inscripturated words of God is in spiritual danger and could become a unorthodox sect. Not my words, his And many people have uh, done reviews of the Passion Translation. This is just one. Mike Winger, the Bible thinker, has hired many, many Greek and Hebrew scholars to do their reviews and analysis of the Passion Translation. And overall, by and large, everyone has said something similar, that this Passion Translation is dangerous and is not the Bible and should not be understood or taken as the scripture. So here they are treating it as scripture, promoting it. So here we go. I continue. Well, yeah, we, they, they all sold. Sorry. And sold all of them Michael sold out, apparently. So they sold after the first service, they're so gone. They They've sold so them see all. This? You can't have one. <laughs> they sold them. Let me ask about this. Is there any, any so let me just actually the- figure they sold all of them out in their bookstore. They have uh, t- some estimates to 20,000 people in their church that attend regularly. Um, that could be a lot of people. And I don't know what their online store did, but that could be a lot of people buying that book that as a Bible, as if it were the Bible. And she says those people are in spiritual danger. So I warn you, please do not read the Passion Translation. Do not take it for Scripture 
do not take it for the inscripturated words of God. Yeah. Month. Bless month. Yeah. Come on. Merry Christmas. There you go. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this section. Then, he uh, uh, anybody, talks about uh, anybody come from South Africa. He wants to know if someone come, came from South Africa or some, some country in Africa because it's very difficult to get there. And actually he's talking about not just coming to their school or something, but but for this service or for this time or whatever, maybe for the open heavens. And someone did come from South Africa through Namibia or somewhere. And what that shows me, that's very interesting because um, – I've actually know people who are at Bethel, and they basically say that their, their church is basically a school. There's no, um, it's totally overrun by people who are not a Reading natives, um, and so it's very interesting. So this shows that there's a, it's a global movement that people are coming from everywhere in the world because they believe that there's something extra special happening here at Bethel. So I'll just skip this part. And so he gave the Bible, the, the Passion Translation Bible that he had to the person that came from South Africa. So whoever you are, if you see this, if you've gone to, from, from Bethel to South Africa, I warn you that Bible it puts you in spiritual danger. If you treat it as the scripture, inscripturated words of God, as uh, Sheed says, then you are in spiritual danger. So don't use it as scripture. Then get a free Bible, sorry about that. Uh, open your Bibles, if you would, please, to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. The challenge with our faith. So what I noticed now, he's trying to let people probably give have time to get to their scripture to the pace. He told them to turn there, and I see, you hear some ruffling, but not much. And sadly, you don't hear ruffling of the pages anymore when you. I, I do that when I preach. I say turn to this passage, and I want to hear you. You know, turning now. A lot of people have it on their phones. That's fine. You don't hear a lot of ruffling of the pages anymore. So I didn't hear anything there maybe one or two, really, a, a few. He le leaves a long um, pauses, and other people have noticed that. Now, I don't like dealing with the style or the presentation or what have you, but it, it actually is part of it. Um, part of his presentation, part of his, let's say, his uh, modus operandi is giving long, drawn-out pauses and you'll notice that throughout. And I'm going to put a little montage of all the pauses in this sermon together. There's probably at least 15 of them. Really long, drawn-out pauses. Over 10 or 15 seconds long, some of them. So I'll just give a little montage if, of that. Seem to go over pretty good. Let's go right here and do. <clears throat> this word cares means divided mind. Divided mind. Hokley Dokley. Everything about them will be enlightened by God's own personal presence. There'll be no shadows, no dark places. 
one word. This here is Jesus in print. Uh, no. Every time he speaks, he carries the eternal DNA of God into every word that he says. Oh, no, I ain't messing with you. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no, I'm not messing with you. Mm -mm. Amen. That should just about do it. Why don't you stand up? Pretty graceful ending. Feel like our plane just flew into the side of a mountain. You know? Sometimes you land well, sometimes you just don't. You land. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I received that blessing. I just, I accept all the blessings I can get. Amen. Thank you. But this, um, he's really waiting on, I think, trying to draw the crowd out to give him props. And uh, you'll see that as we go along our inability to hear God's voice. The challenge of our faith is our willingness to hear other voices. Another pause. There are so many opinions, ideas, ideologies, they're all competing for our attention and ultimately agree with our that. affection. Mm -hmm. There's Whenever lots the of stuff in our world now that's seeking our attention, seeking our... our, our um, they want us to buy into those ideologies. I'd, I'd give them, give them uh, props on that. A healing, something extraordinary in our lives. He's always trying to anchor our affections into a world we cannot see. When you see cause and effect, you see someone's ear that is deaf, somebody prays, something unseen comes and opens the ear they can now hear. What's happening? The Lord is awakening our affection for a world we cannot see. He's teaching us, he's training us on the superiority of the unseen. Paul anchored into that when he said, what you can't see is eternal, what you can see is temporal. So there's a constant, it doesn't have to be a conflict, but we live oftentimes in a conflict between those two realities, when they're supposed to be joined together in partnership. It's not supposed to be the natural is an evil commodity and the supernatural is great. It's supposed to be fun. So that's together. interesting. I, I, uh, this is actually 
probably pretty good in the sense of, uh, you know, there's this idea of dualism that 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 there's these dueling uh, realities, the supernatural reality and the natural reality, and that they're at, in competition with each other. And I would give him, you know, so somewhat of a pr- uh, understanding of that that, that 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 we should not be dualistic in nature. That we should. Uh, see the supernatural. That we should understand that the, su- the 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 natural and the supernatural. This is this is our father's world, as it were. So, but what I've noticed, I wanted to mention this before I go on. Uh, he often tries to be really cute, really profound, uh, and gives them the silent treatment, which was what we've seen already twice. He, he gives it to them quite a bit in this uh, sermon talk. Um, and to see if they'll respond. I know this is a temptation for p- preachers and teachers. As a communicator for 25 years myself, um, I know that preachers and myself, I'm tempted to be cute and look for that deep golden nugget um, that sounds really spiritual or really deep. I'm tempted to do that. In doing so, you take the eyes off of Christ and the text, and you get people to put their eyes on you and your brilliance, your insight, and for people in the NAR on their revelations. So... um, Bill and other people in this movement are really seeking to have that deep revelation, that deep nugget that people will respond to. And he wants to give them time to make sure that they know how deep and how brilliant his revelations are. In the size of the harvest, the natural is supposed to cooperate with the supernatural and you and I are the agents that connect. So the natural is supposed to connect with the supernatural and you and I are the agents that connect the two. So do we connect the supernatural and the natural world? Um, I don't see a text that would give us that indication, uh, but then uh, here he goes with a long pause. And that's good in the background. That's good. A seven second pause. Both hope and hopelessness are contagious. Both hope and hopelessness are contagious. Okay, that's interesting. I don't know where he gets it textually, but it's a it's an idea that might have some merit. What kind of influence you want to have on the world around you? Because both are contagious. Faith comes from hearing God's voice. Nope. Sorry, Bill. I have to disagree with you right away from the get-go, and I really disagree with this. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ, Romans 10, 17. He's taken a bit of that and twisted it to his own meanings. Faith comes from hearing God's voice. No, it does not. Hearing some nebulous voice or some inner voice or some inner thing, that's the whole content of his talk now, and I will have to rebut this strongly. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. What is the word of Christ? His word, the Bible, God's infallible, inerrant word. That's where faith comes from. Sola Scriptura. We are saved by the scriptures alone, by the words of the text, by the by the by the message therein, not by hearing some um, Gnostic, mystic voice. No. So I disagree. Everybody in the room can hear God's voice. You you wouldn't be saved. Everybody otherwise. in the room can hear God's voice. You wouldn't be saved otherwise. So um, now, if he means by that, everybody in the room can hear and read the text of Scripture for themselves, then I agree. But he does not mean that. The whole sermon is him trying to get you to tune into that that voice that voice of God, that inner voice, that that still small voice, that maybe even uh, out loud, that voice that speaks to you through visions, dreams, and revelations. Yeah. Anyways, nope. That conviction that draws us to him, where we confess, we repent, we turn our lives to him, it's only because it's a response to hearing his voice. We unfortunately, as a an achievement, sometimes centered, people, especially in the Western world, we emphasize our ability, or in this case, inability. And instead of emphasizing our inability or our weakness in hearing God's voice, it would be wiser for us to emphasize his ability to be heard. 
Now, I agree 100%. We should emphasize God's ability to be heard. How is he heard? He's heard through the scriptures. The perspicuity of scripture says that God speaks through the scriptures and it's clear and understandable for the everyday person. Not that you can hear some mystical voice and that's how we communicate with God. No, God communicates to man through his word. And I agree with him if he means through the word of God, but he doesn't. He means some tuning in to some mystical and you'll see it throughout the sermon. He's talking about the voice of God, God speaking inaudibly, audibly, through the still small voice, through impressions, through this and that and the other thing, v- dreams, visions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you're talking to somebody who has a difficult time hearing you, you raise your voice, perhaps you wait till they're looking at you, you do something to help to make sure that you are heard. You take on responsibility to be heard. Exactly. God takes on responsibility to be heard. That's why he wrote it down, or had it written down, sorry, to make sure I'm clear on my language as well, that he had it written down, spoke to the apostles and the prophets, and gave it to us in Holy Scripture. That's why. He makes sure that he is heard. And if he's speaking, he's speaking with authority, with power, through his written word. If you and I know how to do that as people in this human race, then certainly God knows how to do that as our Heavenly Father. He makes certain that he can be heard. Yes, God makes certain that he can be heard. And so if you are to hear God, hear his voice and hear him speaking to you in some way or another, the prophets who wrote the scriptures down never thought, hmm, I wonder if this is God speaking to me. Should I write this down? Should I not? Hmm. No. God speaks and it is clear. There's no equivocation. The prophets didn't think, I don't know. Uh, I feel like it is, but I just, hmm. And that's where he's right. God is heard, and when he's heard, he's heard unequivocally. And now we have those words, those things that the prophets wrote to communicate from God to us in his word, and they are there for us. That's why he did it. God organized that and orchestrated all 66 books to be written for our benefit so that we know what God has to say to us. He's right. He doesn't. It's not hard, but he's talking about tuning in. He's talking about some sort of antenna you have to get up to be able to figure out what God is saying. So the issue is not ability as much as it is willingness. In some ways, the greatest enemy of our heart is busyness. And I don't mean busyness. I being certainly full. agree with that. Busyness is, can, can distract. Absolutely. Schedule. I mean the busyness of heart. Jesus had probably as full a schedule as anybody's ever had. He had people pressing about him constantly, trying to get close, trying to draw from him, questions following him anywhere he'd go. They'd follow him out into the wilderness where there was no food and just stay there without food and just lose concern for their own needs to eat and to drink. They just forget about it. They're with him. So if there's anybody who knew what it was to have demands put on him, it was Jesus. But he maintained that sense of personal peace, if you will. He maintained that peace, that that peace of heart that enabled him to recognize this still small voice. Come again. All right. Jesus maintained the peace of heart that enabled him to hear that still small voice. First of all, my question is, did Jesus need to listen to the still small voice of God? Two problems here. Um, First, this minimizes Jesus' divinity, and it elevates our ability. It makes us able to do the things that Jesus did by listening to the still small voice of God. So he's going to teach you in this sermon how to listen to the still small voice of God, and Jesus did the same thing. He also listened to God's still small voice. So you'll be like Jesus. 
in that you can listen to the still small voice of God. And then second is the idea that of this expressed anywhere in Scripture that Jesus had this peace of heart that enabled him to hear the still small voice of God. I can't think of a place now if you listener, viewer, if you're watching, you listen, and you're, you say, there's this one place where Jesus listened to the still small voice of God. It says that in the text pretty clearly that Jesus listened to the still small voice of God because he had peace in his heart. Then hit me up, put in the comments. I just can't think of one. And I was thinking about this. Again, you don't see him pointing to anywhere in scripture. He hadn't even opened his Bible yet. The Bible's there open and see it, it's on the podium, but it's a prop. <clears throat> the Lord is obviously able to speak dramatically through circumstances. I've seen it circumstances, unusual uh, coincidences. There's so many ways that he talks. All right. So he says, goes on, circumstances, unusual coincidences, and many other ways where he talks. How about one of them being the words of Scripture? Does God also talk to us through the words of scripture, but that's not on the list um, of this little list. Anyways, he has a few things, circumstances, unusual coincidences, and, and sometimes he'll use his words and it's still a small voice uh, according to him so far. That's what he said. So um, one of them has to be that the scriptures is how he talks to us to this, to this day. I'm not, a, I'm not going to say that circumstances aren't God aligning things and using things to his will to, to organize your life, to, um, to sh show his providence, etc. coincidences that actually are God showing you his plan and goodness for you, etc., etc. But is that God speaking to you, or is that God putting all things together to the counsel of his will? I think it's not God speaking, it's God arranging and organizing the, the details of your life for your good and his glory. Romans 8, 28. He works all things together for, the, for the, your good and his glory. So I don't think circumstances are him speaking to you. I think it's him doing his plan, organizing his sovereign plan from all of history. And uh, then coincidence is probably the same thing. Circumstances are coincidences. We don't see coincidence. But um, anyways, um, but he hasn't even mentioned that the word of God is how God speaks yet. So. Sometimes he uses words. But he speaks. And oftentimes it's that still small voice. And it doesn't mean if it's loud around you, you can't hear the still small voice. It just can't be loud inside of you. So does God speak through a still small voice? Here's my problem with that is that uh, how can you d differentiate between your own thoughts, your own mind, your own will, your own understanding, and God's uh, still small voice? How do you differentiate? And I come to that uh, later on in my critique. So I'm going to skip on to 1420 where he says something else for sake, for sake of time. Diligence from it flow the issues of life. Making sure that I maintain not just right attitudes, but I maintain, I protect that peace. I protect the peace that seems to welcome and respond to the slightest nudge, the slightest uh, uh, movement of the Holy Spirit where he speaks to me. Our life depends on his voice. Now, I want to emphasize for those who <clears throat> may not know us well enough, his voice will never contradict his word. All right. So... Our life depends on his voice. Now, he's trying to um, keep himself on the straight and narrow of evangelicalism, as, as it were, to say this is, the, this is our, it will never contradict this word. However, um, J.I. Packer, I, I, I found this quote to be quite fascinating and helpful. Um, he summarized John Owen's view of Scripture, uh, especially according to special revelation, describing the still small voice or depends on God's voice. Um, that once the apostles completed the canon of Scripture, that any other private revelations that lined up with Scripture were unnecessary and superfluous. And if they didn't line up with Scripture, they were false. So even him saying this is contradictory at best. Our life depends on his voice. God's speaking to us. He'll, God will speak to us, and he'll never contradict his word. 
if he doesn't contradict his word, then we don't need it. We don't need God to speak to us in extra special ways with an inner impression or, or an inner still small voice or an audible voice for that matter. If God speaks to us in an audible voice, it should line up with scripture. And if it does, then it's unnecessary. It's totally superfluous. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. And then secondly, we are fickle. We as people are fickle. We may confuse our voice and, the, and our thoughts for the voice of God. We're sinful, and our sinfulness is so deep and thorough that our sinful thoughts may interfere. But his voice is what makes this come alive. We need the voice of God. That's where he activates what's on the page into becoming flesh in us. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? So we need the voice of God to make the scriptures alive. So those who have never had God speak audibly to them or have an inner still small voice that you think is God speaking to you, then those people don't have the scriptures activated for them? No. No, 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 no. Uh, the word by itself is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword, the writer of Hebrews says. No, the word of God is active and alive. It's already activated. It doesn't need you to have some still small voice. It doesn't need you to have some inner thought or, or impression or coincidence or circumstance for the word of God to come alive to you. It is already all by itself active, and it has that sharpness to it, sharper than any double-edged sword, uh, and so it's powerful by itself. You don't need to activate it through anything, through inner thoughts, inner whatever, whatever he means. We need that activation of his voice. We need that activation. So uh, it seems like the word of God to Bill Johnson is not active, not activated until you hear some kind of inner small voice, inner something or other, which is not true. It's bogus, it's garbage. <clears throat> Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, the voice. We live literally by the voice of God. Everything is upheld by his voice. All right, by so he um, quotes Christ, who's quoting um, Deuteronomy 8.3 in his trials in the wilderness, and he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, as if we have to hear God actually say it to us. Now, whether he means audibly, or he doesn't really say, or inwardly, or, or whatever. What Bill forgot to say here is that Jesus said, he answered the devil and said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. What are the words that come from the mouth of God. They're written. Uh, so <laughs> Jesus said it. He showed him it's written. That's where you find those words. You find the words of the from the mouth of God on the pages of Scripture. It's written. And he says that three times in his, in his trial. Jesus answered the devil, and he answered him three times with, it is written. And interesting, uh, the devil tried to, uh, twist the scriptures to his own ends and quoted scripture at Jesus. But Jesus said it is also written. So where are these words? Where can we find these words that proceed from the mouth of God? Every word that comes from the mouth of God, where are they written? 2 Timothy 3, 16. Scripture is God-breathed or breathed out by God and profitable for teaching Reproof for correction and training in righteousness. That is the theonustos, the inspired word of God, the, the breathed out word of God. Now, theonustos, interestingly enough, pneumatology uh, uh, is the study of the Holy Spirit. Theonustos, the breathed out word of God. The breath of God is the spirit of God actually. And so Theonustos is the inspired, God-breathed out word. The Holy Spirit, the word for uh, pneumatology or nustos, uh, is 
breath. So when Bill Johnson quotes that scripture and says that Jesus is saying we should live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, he's not talking about listening or hearing it audibly or hearing it inner, inwardly. He's talking about the scripture, the breathed out words of God. Where are those words to be found? They're found, they're to be found from God, given to us in every book of the Bible, all 66 on the pages of Scripture. That is God's message to us. That is his word to us, his words to us. And we don't need to go searching or finding or tuning our tuner, uh, tuning our tuning fork to the right frequency. We've got it all already in the pages of Scripture. Let's keep going. His word. Our need to hear from him is an ongoing, continual thing. And protecting that peace is what ensures that we will always be a hearer of his voice. Lastly, before we get into uh, Luke chapter 8 here, <clears throat> we know that faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes from hearing. Well, there he actually, I give him credit, there he actually said the right scripture and said it correctly. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Where do we hear that word? We just broke it down. We hear it in the pages of Scripture. We hear that word that he's trying to communicate to us in the pages of Scripture. So there he quotes it correctly uh, before he missed it. He didn't quote it correctly and give the full context. Um, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. In the pages of Scripture, we have everything we need to hear the word of Christ. Hearing by the word well, of here God. here he goes. Anyone who doesn't have devotion to this will sometimes be misled by what they hear. All right, so right there, I just want to say, you don't need to hear anything. There's this com common uh, idea in evangelicalism that you need to hear the voice of God somehow outside of this book that he's holding right there. You don't need to hear anything outside of that. You have everything you need for life and godliness, the re Peter writes in his epistle. You have everything you need for life and godliness. You don't need to hear some nebulous voice. You don't need to uh, tune in, get that frequency right, get that radio tuner. Plus, I'd be more in tune with the moon and the tides. You don't need to uh, get your antenna out uh, to listen. You don't even need to worry about being confused by the things you hear. If you pay attention to it, you will not be confused. It will not lead you astray. Because there are other voices. And as I said to start with today, our issue in building faith and being people of faith is not so much our inability to hear from God. It's our willingness to hear other voices. So that's what I want to talk to you about. We're going to look at a parable, and I'm... Uh, I don't think I've ever taken just one verse to study out of this parable. I always read the whole thing. I like studying the whole thing. We're not going to today. It's recorded here. I think a more complete version is in Matthew 13. So why do you take one verse out of it? Because it's proof texting. You know, that's why you teach through at least a good portion of Scripture to give the whole idea, the whole concepts, so you, so you can't actually, it's, it's protection for you. Uh, it's, it's guardrails, you know, exegetical expository preaching are guardrails for you so you don't accidentally proof text. And that's what preachers, modern day preachers don't, don't understand about expositional preaching. It, they're guardrails for you there so that you don't actually accidentally take something out of context. It's the parable of the seed and the sower. It is the cornerstone parable. It's like, if you get this one, everything else falls into place. <clears throat> and in this story, there is, uh, Jesus uses an illustration of seed, a sower, and soil. The seed is God's word. Now, just think with me. The seed is what God says to you and me. That seed, if you take a kernel of corn, it carries excuse me, when you plant it into the ground and it grows an ear of corn, every kernel on that ear of corn 
has the exact same DNA as the colonel that died in the ground. Okay. Um, he goes a lot, on a lot about DNA in uh, this sermon. The DNA of God is whatever he says. Let me let him go on a little bit more till the 1730 mark. Same DNA. So the Lord died that you and I might have life. And whenever he speaks to us, he actually gives to us a seed that carries his entire full DNA. The DNA of God is in the seed of whatever he says. Mystery solved. The DNA of God is whatever he says, meaning we can become possibly God by listening to his voice. We now carry his full DNA. If we listen to and tune into that right frequency, I contend that this is very precarious because does God, when God speaks, does his, is his DNA in those words? What is God's DNA? He's immutable. He's holy. He's perfect. He's, I mean, now his words, everything he says are perfect, but can you, by receiving that, do you receive the DNA of God? I don't think so, man. Um, this could be borderline with little God's theology that once you receive God's word, you listen to it, you take it in, you, uh, you know, digest it and do all that good stuff that you can, you have the DNA of God. So we now carry his full DNA. I, wow, this is really, really treacherous territory that he's uh, wading into those waters. When he speaks to us, he's actually depositing something that has the capacity to bring absolute, complete, total transformation to our lives. So, uh, James put of course, this... Now, the Word of God does transform our lives, and it ought to. It should. We are being transformed from glory to glory, but does he implement or implant his DNA, God's DNA into us? No. So I wish these guys would just get away from the term DNA. What, I don't understand why they do that. DNA is the makeup of who we are, right, as people. God doesn't have DNA because he's, cor he's not corporeal. Corporeal meaning a physical body. He does not have a DNA like unto us. So his DNA, by that he means his spiritual makeup, who he is. That's what I'm guessing he means because... It's a word that God does not have a DNA as we do. So um, he's not corporeal, but he has a makeup. Who, what makes him who he is? He's giving that to you through the words. So I think this is very, very dangerous because it's saying that you can have that implanted into you somehow, like the seed. So the seed is sown into you and you become or you have the makeup or the DNA of God in some way or another. I don't know. They said, in humility, receive the word implanted. So humility is the condition of the soil. In humility, receive the word implanted. And then it says, which is able to save your souls. So the, the ability to save, uh, you're already born again. The people he wrote that to were already saved. So he's talking about the ongoing transformation of life. The power for that transformation is in the seed that was received. Here comes a long pause. Take an acorn. There's a billion oak trees in that acorn. And more. You plant the acorn, you get an oak tree that gives many more acorns. You plant these, those acorns, you can see how the cycle goes. When God speaks to us, he oftentimes speaks to us in seed form. He's just looking for soil that will steward what he has said. All right, so this goes around the NAR quite a bit. I've seen this by lots of teachers, actually former worship leaders at Bethel say this quite a bit. Now, I don't know if they're getting that from Bill or, or where, but... Um, Jesus is just, look, God's just looking for soil that will steward what he said. He's looking for good soil. The idea here is that you can be good soil and that your posture somehow makes you good soil. Uh, Jesus interprets his own parable, first of all, um, but the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word, understands it, and then produces a crop, yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. So a person who has good soil hears the word of God. They don't listen to a voice. They're taking in the word of God, 
as it's written, hears it, understands it, and produces a crop, produces fruit. Good fruit has nothing to do with hearing the voice of God in the sense of tuning your ear to hear his gentle whispers or even to have that correct posture to hear him. The fruitful soul is a person who hears his word, understands it, and gladly produces fruit. That's the person with good soil. You can't make yourself good soil. You can't, uh, I, I mean, you need to humble yourself and repent from your sins and dig your heart into to that word. There's no good soil out there because we're sinners, <laughs> yeah, in need of a savior. And the only way he can redeem us is by faith in Jesus Christ. You know, making yourself good soil I think there's there's no indication in that text there that we can make ourselves good soil. So like I said, I'm going to try and do this on a couple episodes, uh, hopefully just two. I'm going to stop it there today. Thanks for listening to this episode of Church Entrepreneur's Podcast. You can find out more information about my ministry at my website, richardpmore.net. I also blog at richardpmore.blogspot.com. If you're on X still or Twitter, uh, formerly Twitter, you can check me out at, at Richard P. Moore 23. You can also email us at churchpreneurs at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. If you have any ideas for a podcast or any thoughts or questions, please reach out on one of those platforms. Until next time, God bless and take care. <laughs>